call the Newport City Council meeting to order for Monday, May 6, 2019, 6.30 p.m. City Council room, all members of the council are present. Um, James Johnson is absent, and in his presence we have Stacey Terry uh, acting on his behalf, and we have the city manager, Laura Gomez. The next item will be to approve the minutes of April 15, 2019. <coughs> Motion has been made to approve the minutes. Is there a second? I'll second. Made and seconded. Discussion on the minutes? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Ayes have it. Motion carries. The next item will be comments by members of the public. That for anything. So we'll move on. The next item would be the local emergency management annual plan adoption and vote. Um, this is a plan that has to be approved every year. Um, Jamie can kind of give a brief overview um, about the plan. So basically, it's just a plan uh, for every major disaster to open up the North Operation Center. Who's going to be involved? Who's going to be at the center? Um, we name all of our, you know, key issues that we may have, like pulling grain, the uh, fuel farm over off Block Road, things like that that we need to be aware of. Um, and then for administration, uh, points of contacts like the mayor, city manager, um, Seth, Tom, what kind of equipment we have, what we have available. Um, so I sent out Tom basically looked at who we would use for a supplier, like Hawkins, Sand, Gravel, Ghostland, so on and so forth. That was in this plan. And once we adopt it, it goes to Walmart's management. They adopt it, it goes on file in case we do have a major disaster, we're out of the funds. So without the plan, we're not out of the Okay, so that's the plan. You have verified all the daycares? Yes. Yeah, then we had a couple, and then there was one that we took away because we didn't pass away. Then we would need a motion to approve the local emergency management plan. I move to adopt the emergency management plan. The motion has been made. Is there a second? I'll second. Made and seconded. Discussion? Next. Oh, one question. Mm -hmm. I noticed that um, Becky Patel. The Department of Health Emergency Preparedness Specialist is not in there. Is no. that there's no room for that? She's still at LEPC. <clears throat> Sorry? She's still the local emergency planning. Oh, as opposed to a minister. Right. Gotcha. Yes. Okay. Thank you. This is our <clears throat> our plan. Gotcha. Yeah. Any other questions? Then hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes have it. Motion carries. item is wave B and large event request. Um, we have guests from the right department here. Mr. Mayor, I'd like to mention something before we start. On uh, April 16th, we approved the uh, events policy and it was approved for one year. Right, so on April 16th, 2019, the events policy was invalid. It was only good for a year. And that's the way the uh, motion was written. And then I said we would review at another time. Now, part of the problem I have, and I'm gonna bring this up, it's because on the 318 meeting, the first one we had, 
I mentioned this events policy and that it was time to look at it again. And we've had two meetings since then. So we, in, in effect, we don't have an events policy because we said it was going to be good for a year. I think there's a different perspective. I think the policy is in effect until the council changes it. And um, it specifically have, says one year. It doesn't say maybe one year or we'll go on whether or not uh, it's we also re on our, reworked it or. And it's on our agenda tonight for review. So that's, I'm sorry, so that would mean that if you're saying we don't have a policy, we can't do <coughs> any events until the policy is in place. Not under the policy until the policy is approved. Okay. Did the notes from the minutes read that it was for review in a year or invalid after a year? It says move to approve the proposed events policy for one year. I think we need to look at what the record reflects because those are the I can notes. show you the minutes. I, I know what's reflected in the I'd like to see minute. that because I think that's a disservice to the people that came here tonight. Particularly when... I don't been, need you to explain to me or tell me what I'm doing is not correct. I'm All right. Saying, I didn't say Let's it keep it civil, correct. please. Right. Let's both keep it civil. We have people that have come out. I understand tonight. that. We have a proposal or a presentation to make that um, council has a right to discuss. Melissa and um, Jess and I have met. We probably put in 12 hours into our conversation that we're going to have tonight with the intent of proposing to the council that the amendments go into effect July 1st so nobody is caught off guard, that there's a smooth transition. I'm not trying to catch anybody off guard. I'm just saying what the motion said. Let's, let's, yeah. was... Mr. Mayor, the fact that there appear to be no members of the Recreation Committee that were involved in that 12 hours of work is very disappointing. I think that's why we have a Recreation Committee, to ensure that we have diverse opinions represented in our policies. The rec committee doesn't really get involved in these types of events. They should. I think policy is usually the purview of, of, the, organiza of the organization. Right, um, like the recreation department has a recreation committee, and that's the board that provides the general oversight. And their purpose is very specific, I believe. Yeah, they don't, the recreation committee doesn't provide oversight to the recreation department. There's two oh, very separate the, the mission of the rec committee and the bylaws that are there for them to help with vibrancy to advise the city council on recreation needs in the community and things like that. If there was an issue and we wanted to bring a specific topic to them for review, I think that that might be appropriate. But um, given the experience that I have with them so far, they're a group of parents that have very little um, spare time. And what they're trying to do is create events and vibrancy and activity to augment what the recreation department is already doing. So I think that if there was a specific question, we certainly could bring it to them for their opinion, but it's not part of the bylaws for them to oversee this type of policy stuff for the recreation department. So. If it is the opinion that we do not have a policy at this point, um, then would it be prudent to listen to the presentations and then not approve tonight until we do have a policy in place. And once we have a policy in place, then we can review the presentations tonight and then notify people whether or not their event's been approved. That would be up to the council. Has the council concurred that there is no policy in place, or is that Dan's opinion? Why don't there are three organizations that have jumped through the hoops and for uh, events? Um, we can so consider them absent the policy as, as before. And then later on in the agenda, when it says uh, the policy review, at that time we can review the policy. Uh, <coughs> it's too late now to rearrange the 
agenda. Regardless of whether you have a policy or not, the main thing is they're here to have us waive their event fees, policy or no policy. You know, so it's, you know, they came to do a presentation that asking for all of the fees to be waived regarding their event. We could do that with or without a policy, you know. That, it depends, that's a separate. We have a policy to help organize things, but, when, and, and to come up with what the structure, or what the fees would most likely be on the, on the city. But, we, could, we know that, we know what the cost is. Um, we can have them do their presentations and go from there. That's just my opinion on it. Um, because their main, the main goal for them to come here is to ask for the council to waive the fees. And, and to quantify what those fees are, and then right. where they come from, and then where they go. Right. So that's so, essentially exactly what the policy does. It does, but we can still move forward with, their, with having them present. Because <laughs> the ultimate goal of anyone who comes to the council, really, in reality, is to get their fees waived. They want to present what they're holding for. They want to present what their event is, and they want to make the case for having the fees waived. And that's pretty much what my thought process is. I don't know how others feel, but that's just my thought process on the whole thing. And bottom line is people come to see us because they want the fees waived. I think we should show look at these things and, and vote on that and then at, when the policy comes up we can approach it then. Uh, but Dan does have some valid points. Uh, we just shouldn't make these people suffer for right. our action. So I think you know my I think that we you know the actions that obviously is to we don't want to compete people, we don't want to make things more difficult for folks. But I don't want to sit here in two weeks and have somebody come back to me that we acted um, invalidly because we didn't have a policy in place and come back and get hit with that because you didn't have a policy and you went and broke these things. So, um, if, I, if the council is confident that that's what's going to happen, um, I would rather lean on the side of making this, we'll just, you know, this the, policy. The basis, or excuse so, me, the basis of the fees won't change, right? The no. fees are what the fees yeah. are. Yeah. So, if we're just waiving fees, we're not implementing anything else. Right. Did you have something else, Jess? Yeah, I was just going to say, if, if the goal was to reevaluate the policy in a year, um, couldn't the council decide right now to go ahead and evaluate these events based on that policy and extend the length of that policy? Couldn't you vote to move the policy forward an extra three weeks to cover this until we had a chance to review tonight's amendments? I mean, you could. I don't know why you wouldn't. Right. I mean, this, what the policy does is it tabulates those expenses and it gives you the opportunity to assign them to the department so now it's penalized. Right. I'll, I'll make that motion. But, um, we evaluate the uh, present requests based on the existing events policy. But I'd like to also say, do no more until the events policy is finalized. I second it. So a motion that's what I was just yeah. motion's been made and seconded. Discussion on that? Actually I would I would like to make an amendment to the motion, <clears throat> if I could. Um, to say that the events policy will remain in place until the thirtieth of June. The current events policy would be made in place to the 30th of June so that we would still have this policy in place until the end of the year, until the end of the fiscal year. Because the new policy would start on the 1st of July. Which was the recommendation anyway. Well, yes. We have a motion on an amendment. A motion with an amendment. Do we have a second to that? Can we have the existing policy in effect to see their change or Right. It would go to the 30th of this year. Right. Well, I mean, it's possible it could be 
or so if you do place? it tonight or changes, that won't take back to the first July first. Correct. Yeah. So you want to be seconding her to the thirtieth? Uh, sure. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> It's, it's Dan's motion, it just takes it to the 30th. Right, yeah. I, I, I just wanted to do okay. it. Okay. All right, so let's motion to amend the policy so that it goes until June 30th, 2019. Motion was made and seconded. Discussion on that motion. And all those in favor of that motion say aye. 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 Opposed? The uh, ayes have it on that. And now we have an original motion. Any discussion on the original motion? <laughs> can, you, can you repeat what that motion was, please? Do you have that? It was soon. You, from Dan? Yeah. yeah. That he evaluated the present request based on the current events policy, but um, not to do any more activities until one has been taken into consideration in the past. The amendment would be to remain to keep the current policy in place until the June 30th year. Yeah. So any discussion on that? And just to clarify, would that mean that we could review other um, applications? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the policy that is expired would continue to lead to the 30th of June, which is the end of this year. And that gives you time to do the review yeah. that we're going to do tonight. Take comments. If that works, fine. It just sounds like a contradictory motion and other motion. But if, yeah. if that's clear enough, then I'm, I'm good with that. They, they, they think it may be contradictory. I think the second half of the motion I should uh, withdraw. Correct. Right. I'm thinking, I'm trying, working it all out of my brain. I'm sitting here thinking about the amendment and the motion. The second says not the right <coughs> one anymore. Right. That's why I'm get I'm the working it out. Just, it yeah. Yeah. So, so, so you're going to. You want to strike? Can you read the second half? Where you said that uh, based on the current events policy, but no more activities done until yeah, you so we'll strike that. All right. Okay. So we should second to this. All second. Okay. So then the motion has been made and seconded. For discussion on that. And all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. Motion carries. Okay. Now we'll have the wave fee and large event request. Yes. Uh, so tonight we have two uh, requests for wave fees, two requests for um, larger special events. So these are events that draw more than 100 people in attendance. So we have some extra considerations there. Um, one, a couple things to note. Um, the Green Mountain Farm to School, their initial letter requesting $207 and $1,056 their request is actually less because they did submit the $25 deposits for both of those events and those events and that's applied towards their fee. Um, so that's just you know the application fee, the deposit. So the, the amount that they're requesting is actually captured on the column all the way to the right on your memo. Um, the last thing to note is that the Out of Darkness Walk and the Farm to School Block Party, or um, the Out of Darkness Walk and portions of the Lunchbox Center Meal Program occur in the next fiscal year. So. I don't know how you guys want to handle that um, tonight, but you know that the new policy will, if there is a new policy and it's adopted on July 1st, then that may. We're saying we're, this is being presented tonight, so it would be under the current policy. Even though that's in the next fiscal year, okay. it'll be under this current policy. Okay. Okay. So um, with that, if you guys are ready, I'll just turn it over to Mary Pat. She's going to tell you a little bit about the Youth Discovery Program. and. Well, as some of you know, um, the Youth Discovery Program originated on the boat uh, with something that uh, Chris had asked us to do from the Mountain Mega Watershed Association was to come on board and offer some sort of educational program uh, to the students that he was inviting. He started inviting all third grade students in Orleans County. And uh, the second year, third year, he did that he realized that just having students on the boat with pizza was not <laughs> cutting it. <laughs> so uh, we said gladly we would come on board and uh, help him with a little more meat to the event. Uh, last year, because the boat did not float, 
we wanted to continue the program. It's been very successful. And so we again invited all the third graders from Orleans County and we went to Prouty Beach and did uh, an on-land program, which was so successful that uh, <laughs> the teacher said, oh, could you make this an all-day program? <laughs> so we're, we're begging people to help us out because we're going to do all-day programs. We uh, start with our first one, I think, on the 30th with 50 or something students that are coming from Dirt. Is that Derby School? I'm not sure. It's either Derby and, and Newport City Schools, both are bringing very large groups. So those will be big, big days. Um, last year, we did not come to you to waive the fees, but we worked with Jessica and we did some in-kind work for her, both uh, for her uh, summer, summer camp and then also helping um, Andy with some planning for um, down along the beach and so forth, which is now being put off with the new plans for the bike path and so forth, but that was part of what we did last year. This year we intend to continue doing in-kind work, but since we don't know quite what we're doing because of all the plans with the bike path and the buffer zone and your walking path, um, we can't tell you how much money we will give you in kind. <laughs> so uh, we've asked that that be continued, but knowing that we will be there ready to help and uh, offer some assistance when the time comes. And I don't remember what our price is. They were looking for $1,148 to cover the use of the facility, so the uh, waterfront area, and then we do let them use the lower beach house kind of room down there. Yeah, and the, yes. Oh, I just was when you done. I have just a question. carefully. <laughs> no, I just have a couple questions. When you, when you, when you. Um, yeah, and it's the last. It's the last week in May and the first week in June. So it's sort of the end of the school activity for those students. So, okay, I'm ready for questions. Do the schools contribute? Schools contribute by bringing their students, their buses, and so forth. Well, my reasoning is we have. The majority of the students come from outside of Newport, and that's the way I'm looking at it. That's actually not well. You know, Dur looking, Derby has a big group, right? But I'm looking at you know, I'm not trying to. I didn't say I'm against this. I'm just asking the questions because Tony, uh, Tony Pomelo's foundation used to subsidize the boat, and do you still get grant money from we, the we Pomelo have gotten, Foundation? We have gotten money from Pomelo Foundation. We did not ask this year the Pomelo Foundation because we did get a grant. MWA got a grant to buy some other supplies, which we would have gone to him for. Last year he bought us a hundred, um, uh, uh, 20 wonderful binoculars. If anybody wants to know what are good binoculars to have for, for young people and for adults, they're really great. Uh, he donated the money for that, which was wonderful. No, I was only asking because I know the other communities have a lot less tax rate than we do, and we have a lot of people, you know, come to the city every year. And for for us to waive fees and waive fees and to do everything to help with a lot of things for free, but I was just curious about the schools. Well, I can tell you. It's a question I asked. I asked the other the, the ch early childhood parade because we that's a big expense, and that's helping all the other schools, you know. Um, on our on our tax dollar here. Well, we're in a watershed association. <laughs> but but it's a, but it's the city taxpayers who have to bear the burden and you know here. and so let me finish please. Um, who have to bear the burden and, and that, I'm just asking it. Didn't say I'm opposed to doing it. I've never been opposed to waiving fees. I just like to have my questions answered. Um, and I like to stress that. The other municipalities have a lot less tax rate than the city of Newport, and the schools have a lot less tax rate. And I just wanted to stress that aspect in this whole thing. You know, I'd like to make that point because everyone seems to look to the city for everything. And if you go to Derby, if you look at their municipal rate, and even the educational rate up there, it's a lot less than the city of Newport. So I just wanted to stress that. Point made. 
I think too that uh, something I want to point about this point out about this program in particular is two things. Um, these guys will be doing that in kind. So even though their contribution here is twenty five dollars, the contribution that they'll be making for the new well rec path that connects the bluff side and the bike path will be far beyond one thousand one hundred and forty eight dollars. And the second thing is because this is a water lake based activity that's reaching out directly to the, the kids that are in the schools, I think it's really important with our community plan, the way we're looking towards the lake, all the lake engagement that we can get in the community is even, it's a meeting that community needs. So it's a direct hit on that community need, which is one of your criteria in there. So I think there's some good benefits for this one in particular. Okay, that's all I have. I, you know, it's a wonderful thing because all these young people will be stewards of the land. Yes. And we're teaching them the right thing. And they, and they learn a lot. They're very excited well. about it, too. Yeah. And it's not, I, you know, we weren't sure how it was going to work at Crowdy. But in many ways, it's better than the boat because it's very hands-on. They get in the water. We look for critters. We draw maps in the sand. I hope we have sand. <laughs> but, yeah. So it's, it's really, I don't, I think if we can, we will continue to use Prouty even if and when the boat floats. I mean, we'll go on the boat, but we'll also keep this program going. I'll make the motion to waive the fees for the MWA program. Motion to made. Is there a second? I'll second. Name second. Discussion? And all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes have it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next two on your list, one is uh, for the Lunchbox Summer Meal Program. So this is for the, the community meals that set up every Thursday at the Farmer's Market area. And um, also Green Mountain Fire Crew School is looking at hosting their block party. They did host this block party back in 2016, I believe, um, but just haven't had it for a couple years and they're looking at bringing that back. So the Lunchbox Summer Meal Program is just a labor of fees at uh, $1,031. And then the Green Mountain Block party is a waiver of fees of 182 and also the special event request, so approving that, that large event request. Um, and then Sophie is here to talk to you a little bit about those. Hi, um, Sophie, Communications and Development Coordinator for Green Mountain Farm to School. Green Mountain Farm to School is a nonprofit organization located on 2nd Street. Um, we have four main programs, the Farm to School program, which is um, in school programming at 22 Northeast Kingdom schools. We also have um, a food hub, Green Mountain Farm Direct, bringing local food to cafeterias, retailers, hospitals, institutions around the state, or the kingdom specifically. Um, and then we have the Harvest of the Month, which is a statewide marketing campaign to promote seasonal Vermont grown crops. And then of course the Lunchbox food truck, um, which is a summer meal site focused on filling the summer nutrition gap um, uh, we've been running the Lunchbox since 2013, um, providing free nutritious meals to children in our region. <coughs> Last year, we served um, the, our largest amount of meals to date um, at 1,800 free meals. We also have um, affordable adult meals for purchase, and we focus on, um, again, local uh, produce in all of our meal offerings. Um, so yes, we um, are looking to waive fees for the um, lunchbox. We would like to return to the Causeway bystand area from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Um, every Thursday starting June 20th and then ending August 22nd. Um, this time slot and then that location is really ideal um, for walkable communities and getting children um, uh, nutritious healthy meals throughout the summer um, and it's allowed us to achieve a greater connection with our program's target population um, so as Jessica mentioned the fees that we requested to waive was 1031 30, there you go um, in addition to this we're also looking to host the summer block party um, I believe in 2017 was the last year that we hosted it um, if I I was not uh, working for GMFTS at that time uh, but the event is a big hit. It typically draws in hundreds of families. Um, we coordinate with the Parks Department as well as a couple of different um, organizations in the area. Um, it's to promote the free summer meals as well as um, kids' wellness and other nutrition initiatives. 
Um, so that will be on Thursday, June 20th from 3 to 5. Um, other considerations you may want to take, uh, the truck is a, it's like a physical truck, it's 31 feet long, um, and we also carry our own liability insurance for that. Um, just one more note that I didn't mention, in addition to the free meals, we also focus on hands-on educational activities um, and nutrition, literacy, and outreach. Questions? I guess it's the same question. Is the food truck who do they? Is it just Newport children, or is it all over? So I think our focus in our our Newport location is definitely the children in in this area in Newport. Um, we do operate the food truck in Barton as well, uh, but those these would be different. Yeah. So one nutritious meal a week. Um, so at. The Gardner Park location, it would be um, lunches on Thursdays, but we also have, I think we have three other locations this summer. Um, I believe it's the um, the junior high, the Newport Junior High will be doing dinners and um, Barton will be doing lunches and then there's another location. Uh, sorry, I'm not the project coordinator for it. <laughs> um, there's one more location that we will be yeah, I think the high school. The high school. Yeah. Yeah. So, so is the purpose to introduce children to nutritious food? It's to give them free meals. So, so to offset, I mean, one meal is not going to make any sure. difference in a child's life, one meal a week, I wouldn't think. Um, well, I mean, I think that there's a pretty strong argument for the summer nutrition gap. So yeah. in areas where there's free and reduced yeah. lunches, there's, there's even that, those small amount of Maybe it's just one meal for, but for families struggling financially, uh, one meal for you know three children could make a significant impact on their food budget for the month. Okay. Do the adults pay, or do the, they? They're for children, but say I'm coming with three kids, and three kids get it for free. Yep. Do, 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 do I have to pay? Do you have to help? pay. Yeah, but it's a very affordable meal. I will no, tell you. No, I was just curious. Yeah. So it's just a curiosity. I think it's about seven dollars, and for a really good sized salad, and I also think they have a, a wrap option as well, typically. Yeah. Okay. Other questions from council members? Then there's no motion yet, so you can wait till we have a motion, please. I'll make a motion to waive the fees. The motion to made. Is there a second? I'll second. Seconded. Discussion from council members first. I have a question. This is an amazing program, and we've had it now for three years, right? Um, since 2013, yeah, for a while. Five years. Yeah. Six years this is going to be. My question is more, how on earth do we get to a fee of $167 for two hour parking on a gravel area. That's an area where people can park overnight. Why are we charging $167 for a vehicle to sit there for two hours to provide a service that our kids are benefiting from? I'm just curious, how, we, how on earth do we get to that figure? So these are part of the approved rates that we have from council every year. And the, uh, the lunchbox, although they're parked there, they are using restroom facilities and, and trash receptacles. So it's actually quite a bit of trash that's generated every year. We have to keep an eye on the seagulls and stuff that have their ways. But the, um, so the, what they're getting charged is uh, an hour uh, rate for a green space that's been approved by council. So that's, that's but the we don't, of it. We don't charge the vehicles that park overnight there. And they use the same receptacles and they can use the bathroom as well so it just doesn't make sense to me and yeah, they're yeah. not drawing in you know however many 50 60 people a day um, to park there so there's a little bit of that's money. that's an awful lot of money for a couple of bags of litter it truly is I mean, do the math oh does, well, does yeah. that make sense to you yes it does okay. it does make sense we have to charge you know we have to have a rate structure for our facilities the, you know, it does make sense for a rate structure. If I was a for-profit business coming in and I wanted to have the fees waived for, I was going to be there daily, every day or whatever, and I came in to have my fees waived, that'd be crazy because I'm tying up the space. And I know what Jess is talking about with the seagulls and how much trash is generated. I do know that, and that's an expense on the city. So that fee structure, I, I, I agree with the fee structure. It makes perfect sense. Okay. You know, municipalities not here to give everything away for free all the time. 
because we have people who we have people in one breath want us to give everything for free, and the next breath they complain about the taxes. And so, you know, I hear that all the time. People want us to give everything for free, but then when they get that tax bill, they complain about it. So, um, anything else from council? Do we have a motion? Yes. yes. We did. Okay. okay. Most of yes. made and seconded. I just actually wanted to echo. I was going to ask the same very question, Pam. Thank you. Um, to use that section of the front of the park, the bathrooms are like way far away. People are much more likely to go across the street to Wendy's, I think. Um, to charge that much per hour for anyone, I can't even think of a for-profit business that would right. that would fit there. Um, I think is is really outrageous and mm -hmm. if we're gonna have public parks for people to use then I mean it's one or the other we can't be charging people through the nose and saying we have parks and rec it, it, it just doesn't jive so mm -hmm. things like that I don't know why we make people come and beg for our mercy it's it's insulting mm -hmm. for the organizations and I would really like to see this this process be abolished so to get back to the fact that we're talking about waived um, Fees um, structuring, you know, rate, rate structures and stuff is a whole other discussion. I think we should stay focused on whether or not we're going to waive a fee. Also, just to note, the restrooms are right in the information booth, the Chamber of Commerce building, so they're right next to the. Um. All right. Any anything else? Then all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed. The ayes have it. Motion carries. The next item. Um, so the next item is the Out of Darkness Walk, which Amanda is not here, it looks like. Um, they are requesting, I believe this is the third annual Out of Darkness Walk for September 7th. Um, the fees that they're requesting is $198 for the green space on that day. And I believe she had her letter in, in your packet there. So. I'll make a motion to approve waiving the fees for the Out of the Darkness Walk. Motion made. Is there a second? No second. Seconded. Discussion? This Just isn't the one they have in the fall, is it? I thought there was one they have. In September. So this is for the September event. September. If I remember the, yes. It's, um. I'm mistaken. I'm looking at the wrong page. You know, I looked at the wrong page. It's, it's, this is the, yeah. September 7th, uh, 2019 is when this is going to be held. Um, You're forgiven. Yeah. So, anything else? Then all those in favor say aye. Aye. Um, okay. Opposed? Ayes have it. Motion carries. And that's it on that aspect. Thank you, Sophie. Moving on, the next item is the Planning Commission appointee and vote. We have a memo from the from, uh, from Charlie Elliott regarding the recommendation. I'll make a motion to appoint John Lynette to the Planning Commission. Motion made. Is there a second? I'll second it. Made and seconded. Discussion? Yeah. Well, I'll just mention that I was at the Planning Commission meeting where uh, Mr. Minette um, was interviewed and, and he seems like an excellent candidate with planning experience. So happy to have somebody who um, definitely fits the bill. So the motion has been made and seconded. Any other discussion? Then all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. Motion carries. The next item is the event policy amendments and parade policy review and possible vote. And do we have, who wants to give the overview? Laura, you or Jess? On um, some of the highlights of the recommended changes. Sure. I think we're all going to do that. Um, as I mentioned, we've been reviewing this um, since the March 18th meeting where Dan said it's time to review that and um, we came together as a group of interested people. Uh, Jess knows the policy better than anybody. I've been watching it unfold for a year. Melissa was very interested in participating as 
um, and orientation for the work that she's doing here. So over the past year, what we have noticed most significantly is that the policy has worked very well in the areas of, of helping educate the consumer, educate the public in exactly what it is involved in putting on a large event or asking for late fees, and most importantly, tabulating the expense that's affiliated with waived fees for the taxpayer and for the council. Um, we all understand that events are very important to the community. We're not taking anything away from um, people's passion about events. What we are trying to do is get them organized so that the final execution is a better quality product. It's also fair to the taxpayer to make sure they understand exactly what they are funding. Um, and these rates and fees um, that the council adopts every fall is exactly what those amounts are based on. So the council every fall has um, attributed a rate and a fee to every facility and every green space that we have. When a request comes forward, the first thing that happens is Jess sits down with the applicant and goes through the applicant to make sure that there's a clear understanding of, of what's involved. Some people are new at this and don't understand that they're responsible for taking care of, of their garbage, for example, or they need to organize porta potties and so on and so forth. So this is a way to make sure that they understand, particularly for a large event, the magnitude of what's involved. Over the past year, what we've seen come forward are some consistent questions that the council members have had or wondered about, and we did our best to incorporate that in the modified version or the amended version that we're, being, that we're proposing. Under general principles, we wanted to be specific that the benefit was specifically for the city of Newport. We wanted to um, make sure that the city of Newport was highlighted as the benefactor of these events because as we've seen and as you've experienced tonight, you're having people come from other communities on Newport's dollar. And um, as we did with Wednesdays on the Waterfront, um, we noticed so many people from Coventry and Derby and fortunately their um, respective select boards were receptive to the idea of making a contribution to that. And I think that's fair and I think that helps with the direction that this policy um, that the taxpayers would appreciate that this policy takes them as well. Um, so let's see. The other thing that we wanted to clarify is that council has a way to make a decision on how to address these requests for land fees. You have a right to grant in total or, or grant a reduced rate or not grant at all. And the, the policy the objectives and the general principles are intended to help guide that so that there's no surprise to the applicant. The other um, uh, change in this is that with monetary sponsorships, we felt the taxpayer had a right to some accountability around that. So right now, you're giving blank checks to these events with no accountability other than them coming back and saying, that was a great event, we want to do it again. What this allows you to do is to say that you will um, reimburse for an invoice or pay a vendor directly. That way you've got some way to alleviate the burden on the applicant, but you also have that level of accountability so you know precisely where the funds are going. You also have a right under this to ask for, um, for their financial situation and that um, you have a right to ask what other sponsorships they're getting. That's something else that's come up repeatedly is where, what other entities, either private businesses or, or, municip or municipalities, are being approached. And that helps you make a better decision about whether or not you should fund the entire thing or do it on a reduced rate. The insurance is still intact. The, um, the area of um, fair and, and equitable um, dispersal is still there. The fees for municipal staffing, there's still that part, so the motions that you made tonight, what we'll do is make sure that those funds are uh, taken from either waived fees or council special projects and moved over into the applicable line items so that the operational budgets aren't penalized. 
Remember that part? We, we've already authorized the line item for yes. that. Yes. Right? Yep. In next year's budget. Yes. Yep. So what would be effective would be the ones that we're doing this tonight. Year. Right. Will be affected because they'll be in whatever It'll we've be, been doing. Now. Right. You're going to do the exact same thing. Right. So those those lined items will grow in the expense field under city council, but they'll show in the revenue field of the respective department that's being impacted. So we like that. We think that's a good thing because again, that's explainable. It's clear, and um, it's easy to digest. Um, let me just see what else. Um, the fees were the big one. Jess, Melissa, have I, have I hit the salient points? Seems like I'm forgetting something. Um, I wish we could change those bullets to numbers because it would be easier for me to tell you. But on the top of the second page, it says, um, well, it starts on the first page, I guess. As, uh, an effort to create long-term value for the community and encourage a sustainable business model. That paragraph, if you look towards the end, we did put in, as an example, requests may be supported up to when the percentage is in there. So these are monetary, monetary support might be, might be it may be supported up to 100% the first year, 75 the second year, 50% by the third year, and then by the fourth year, priority funding will be given to new requests. So anyone that's coming forward for a monetary value, uh, monetary sponsorship, asking for that amount to be diminishing over time, um, and that priority will be given to new events that we're looking at like seeing money. Mr. Mayor, time. I cannot in good faith consider this policy without seeing a side-by-side -side track changes, what's different between the old one and this new proposed one. I asked for the track changes, I have not received them, just to hear the fact that you would want to reimburse invoices rather than waive fees, that would make most people's events impossible. This is I just not this tenable. Is, and is, I, I will not, not consider it until I see the side by side with track changes. What you just said is not what other municipalities do. St. Albans in particular, Dominic Cloud, I followed up with him, and he said that they only either reimburse or purchase an item that's specific. I'm not so, willing to go there. That's fine. That's fine. Um, I'm happy to provide you the side-by-side -side changes. They're very confusing, but I'm, I'm happy to do that. So we can get those. I think, Jess, you're probably the best person to do yeah, that. Yeah, it won't be in the Google Google. document. It'll be a Google document. You'll be able to see the changes. The track changes. That's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, additionally, um, anybody who will be affected by this policy has only had since this morning to review the new proposed changes. And then I'm going to say this again and again and again. That is not fair to the public. It is not fair to the council. If you want to propose something new, please propose at the meeting before so that the public and the council has time to actually review it before we vote on it. But that's why I had possible votes. Possible. Right. I, I just it's a review. I wasn't going to put that in there, and then I said, "Well, we'll have the word possible just in case." I appreciate that. that's, but that's why I had it as possible, not as like the above where it was just mm -hmm. vote. Thank you. I put possible as giving us the opportunity to say, "Okay, we're just talking about it tonight. We can go to the next meeting or two meetings." So that's why I worded it that way. Mm -hmm. and I think it, I, I'm not sure if I heard you correctly, Joe. Uh, Julie, so it is. For the piece about um, reimbursed, that you know, either a receipt or an invoice, that means it gives the opportunity for someone to be, for an organization to be reimbursed when they've incurred the expense, not when they've paid it. So if they order something, if they give us the invoice, we can reimburse at that, reimburse at that point. That's so that a very detailed that policy in. that I don't think we're prepared to go into tonight. But it, yeah, my thought when I read that is, it's only for the ones that we actually write a check, a check to. For, right. It's not for the waived Wait. fees. It's only like, say for example, Wednesdays on the waterfront where we gave we gave two thousand um, dollars. It'd be like, okay, it costs us two thousand for this one band. They could say it went for that. That's what a lot of municipalities do. Is they ask for a receipt for where the money is going. It's just a, it's like a tracking thing. Right. And it's, it's not it's not to be onerous that was my take on reading it um, is 
It's only when you, we write a check. And they're the only ones that I think ask for an actual check. They're the only ones that ask for an actual check. That's the way I interpret that. That's because they're different things, right? Okay. Any th other? What are the this other is, big? This is after the fact. They have to show the receipts to get the money here. Yeah, we're we're in the we're <coughs> So these are two different. No, they're not. Where do you see that they're? This is this is this is after right. So this is saying that we want to see, um, you know, where where did the money go? And this is saying, and this you're right. And number seven is we the monetary sponsorships. We can reimburse when we see something that shows that you've incurred the expense. So you have it in two places, which can make it even more confusing. No, this is, they're two different things. So well, I, this I is principles and this if is procedures. they were two different things and you told me they're the same thing. So number seven <laughs> reads, monetary sponsorships are based on a reimbursement model where proof is provided for expenses incurred before payment is issued from the city. For example, invoices, order confirmations, or receipts are accepted. Reimbursement will be for the actual amount of the expense and not to exceed the amount of the approved sponsorship. What number two says, I think it was number two on the yes, number two. Applicants requesting monetary sponsorships should expect to be asked to provide a copy of the event's financial records. It's not that one, it's the next one. Which one is that? No. That's the one. That's the one. Oh. Um, the financial records, including but not limited to income and expenses and sponsorship records. Right. Those so, are two so, separate things. Right. So. And that's what I was saying. This mm -hmm. one is after the fact. They, you're asking to see mm -hmm. what they did with the money. This one is you're going to pay the money. No, this one is part of the procedure. So yes. So yeah. I, I think basically yes, Dan. This is saying that you're right. This is saying that this is how you're going to get your money. Right. This is saying this is after the fact. We want to count. The accountability after the fact. Okay, thank you. Yes. Um, the only other big thing is um, the, the dates. So instead of having these event applications coming in all the time um, and then kind of coercing them, I try to bunch them as much as I can for your meetings just because it's easier to just do a lot of them at once. Asking the applicants to come in during a rolling deadline quarterly so that that we can kind of bunch them naturally because at any given time if you come into our office we're at the beginning middle and end of these processes and it would be a lot easier to kind of bunch them all up so we put together some quarterly deadlines to help us facilitate that process a little bit more officially we give this to people in advance so that they know when when the deadlines are coming similar to any grant you know process um, so that was an addition that we put in here um, the other thing that I want to mention is although the, although this seems uh, like a lot on these few pages to digest all at one time, in the field and putting this into action, it's actually been really smooth. And I, I, I don't believe there's been any users that have gone through this process that have come and given any negative feedback. I know I haven't given any negative feedback. And I know that with Mary Pat and with Sophie here tonight, what they saw in front of them today, they had no recollection that any of this was up for dispute or there was anything wrong with this process or anything. So the, this, the actual process when we go through it with the users is very friendly and smooth and it's not as scary as this document looks. The, over the course of the year, this has actually worked really well for us. So I just want to throw that out there. It's not, um, it's not super scary to the user, so. One thing you asked for is a parade policy. Yes. That's now, I had a couple questions answered, but I want to make sure. The Memorial Day parade, mm -hmm. is that standard every year? Yes. So there's no chance of that being trumped by something else? That will go on as long as the Legion and the municipality and board owns the partner to make that happen decide that they want to do that. That will. So that's not being overruled by the parade policy or anything. Because no. no. I remember there's been that parade since before I was a kid. And, I mean, that could be something, I mean, this is here to discuss. So, you know, that needs to be put in there specifically. It can be. We I mean, might want to put it in there just so that there's no confusion, kind of like what we do with the coin drop policy. It says priority is given to the RAC, the fire department, and the veterans groups. Well, yeah. th those days should be blocked out. If somebody came to you for a parade, those days would probably already be blocked out, wouldn't they? Yeah, so the parade policy actually does have a line. Um, it says here that. Uh, 
number two, parades hosted by city departments and we get a preference. So we're subject to the same process as everyone else. We have to submit our letter of interest, just like the coin drop. So we submit, you know, the fire department and the rec department will submit an interested letter for the coin drops. So you guys approve those first, and then you give the open spaces to however the things fall out. So we did include that provision in here intentionally, knowing that that works really well for us. I'd be hesitant to include the Memorial Day parade specifically because things come and go, and we want to make sure that we're, as long as we're giving priority, that means any any desire. I just don't want a chance. I mean, that's well, something that... Well, just because it's in our policy doesn't mean if the legion decides they don't want to do it. No, no, but I'm just saying, that, then it could be changed then. Yeah, and it also See, says, what I'm getting at is I just don't want... Well, we, we I, may I want miss, a we may miss the review deadline, so you don't want to risk that. <laughs> well, I just don't want to take it, uh, uh, you know, have something that would all of a sudden say, oh, oh, by the way, you can't have a parade this year. Oh, and we also and have you know, that's been going on for over 50 season. years and long. Yeah, that's and that's just when I first read that policy over the weekend. I actually talked to Jim Johnson and said, how long is the Memorial Day parade been going on? I said, I remember it when I was a kid, and I'm, you know, and so I just want to make sure that nothing overrules that one of those traditional things that... Can I, can I just add that by by doing them like in one quarterly swoop all together, because there's a line item now for way fees and money we give away, so it's not just this vast pit of just give it away, um, you, I think the council can better manage how they're distributing the money because they'll know exactly how much is there and how much they've expended already. And if everybody comes in with a you know $5,000 request, um, you know, that's sort of not in the realm of what to do. So I think it gives a better handle for the council to be able to distribute the money equitably. It's not just a matter of who gets here first or in the past of just having a bottomless pit. Definitely makes it more manageable. Mm -hmm. Mr. Mayor. Um, With this proposed parade policy, it actually who does get there first because it suggests that requests <coughs> for parades will only be accepted between January 1st and January 31st. Imagine if the Centennial Parade had been discovered as an idea on February 1st of that year. I mean, limiting the number of parades regardless of what's going on, whether it's a bicentennial year or some big thing, is just tying our hands so needlessly. I just don't understand why anybody would even propose having this parade policy that's this strict. I mean, I get why the coin drop is that way, because it's kind of a pain in the butt to have people collecting money in the middle of Main Street more than four times a year, but parades are community events that people are volunteering their time to put on for the benefit of our city. And to ask them to try to figure out what they want to do in September between in January of the previous year is just ludicrous. I don't necessarily agree with that. I think that major parades are a year-long process to put together, just from my limited knowledge of them. Um, and uh, parades are disruptive to the community. I mean, they're great and they're wonderful, but to have a parade all the time, I think, is disruptive to people who are trying to go about their business. Um, I think four parades a year is perfectly adequate for a community our size. Jeff, do you know how many community. parades we've had in the past, let's say, in um, a year to year, say, fiscal year? It's about four. So it's about four. We have some walks that are just mm -hmm. on the bike path. Those are included in this. So, so three actually. So we had the children's parade, Memorial Day parade, the fall foliage festival, car parade, the centennial parade. But that was kind of an oddball one. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I've heard murmurings of maybe Aqua Fest. Um, there was a Santa parade once a long time, mm -hmm. a couple times there. But. So. I don't know if this has been offered before, but I would strongly encourage the rest of the council to come out to a parade and watch what it is that the city of Newport has to do to get one set up. And I've said this before, the Week of the Young Child Parade is my favorite event of the whole year. I love that parade. I love the kids. There are 125 kids walking in the street. We have four police cars. The very second that an emergency call comes in and those officers have to leave, you still have 125 kids in the street. Mm -hmm. And so what these event policies are doing is being not only assisting the rest of the city departments in scheduling and setting up and the infrastructure that's required, but specifically for my agency, I cannot order officers in to do a parade. It is against the union contract. So if they don't volunteer to be paid overtime to do it, 
I don't have the personnel to staff the parade. Now, the week of the young child, you know, usually have fistfights downstairs because guys want to be involved in that one because we all love it. But if the council doesn't understand the magnitude of what's going on out on the street for the event, it's very difficult to make these types of decisions. So the, the, um, the centennial was a horrid example because with all due respect, I hope we don't ever do anything that large again because of the amount of work that was involved in it. But you, you've got to come out and see what it is, how DPW sets up an hour ahead of time and has every single guy from the DPW department, with, and I think including Tom, at specific stations throughout the city. Because you can't just say, we're going to throw a barricade up here and we'll put some cones up there. It has to be strategically done in a specific order. Otherwise, we're going to have mass chaos with traffic. We're going to have backups, we're going to have accidents, and then it's all going to come back on the city to begin with. So I have, I have no problem. I, I like the idea of a policy simply to help guide us, but I'm strongly encouraging you to come out to a parade, and I will even pull myself aside and just walk you through what it looks like to say, you know, this is what's going on here. We got officers stationed there. We all have radio communications. Even dispatch is involved in this. something as simple as just the parade. So one of the other things that's important to recognize is one of the reasons why your guys love the Week of the Young Child Parade is because it's during normal work hours. When you have a parade that's off hours, you're paying your public works time and a half and you're potentially paying um, your police department triple time and a half. So that's the other reason why the city has to be mindful and start getting our arms wrapped around what the impacts really are. And uh, it, it is, um, we have the expense of the signs um, we have the expense of the staff. Um, we have other considerations. We have to make sure that the ambulance is aware and that the traffic patterns are aware. It's, it's behind the scenes stuff is where the expense comes from and that's what we want the taxpayers to understand. It doesn't just magically happen. As far as the Centennial Parade goes, that was two and a half years in the making. That was something where we worked with the Agency of Transportation and we had their guys come from the Berlin office um, for a meeting more than once. To, I understand, um, and I think you heard my point. I don't need to hear the backstory of two and a half years. I do want to share, though, that there are so three or four parades. We have, we have provisions. This was built to accommodate the parades that we've had existing over the past few years, the ones that have come and gone. We've, I don't think ever, besides the centennial year, where we maybe had a fifth. No, that would still be just four. We've never had more requests for that. As we adopt this policy, just the same as the coin drop, the community will start to learn and understand that there is a policy and that they need to be aware of those deadlines if they're interested in hosting a parade. This is built to capture the people that already know. The only new additional parade that I've heard of is the Aquafest parade. They already know that this is coming down the pike. And we, our office is such that we know who those event organizers are. This information will go out long in advance before you, you know, implement it, I would assume, um, to help everyone learn that curve. But Looking at a coin drop and the amount of work or the pain in the butt that is the coin drop, the parade is night and day. Way more of a pain in the butt to have the parade. Uh, and the other last piece that I'll add is, if we're having a parade every month in the city of Newport, they're going to start to be really sparsely attended. Having four per year, one per season, which captures, captures the big times of year, those, the amount of celebration that we want to do around a parade, is going to draw that critical mass. If we start to have more than four per year, we're starting to, it's going to get a little bit sparse. So. I've been hearing for two years, what if, what if, what if we have more parade requests? And it sounds like we're not getting more parade requests. Mm -hmm. Why do we need to be so, um, it's not even proactive, it's, it's reactive in anticipation of requests that are going to overwhelm us, which we're clearly not getting. Why? There, why put a policy in place that's not necessary? Until it's necessary, I have no interest in a parade policy. And I, I hear the chief, I, I understand it takes work, but that's what our city services are for. We have provided a recreation department to do things like this, not to charge people to have every event, not to jump through 25,000 of hoops if somebody wants to volunteer and put on an event for our citizens. I, I just don't understand it. It's planning and organizing, it's transparency for the taxpayer. It really is full circle. How many taxpayers complain about the cost of parades? Taxpayers complain about paying their taxes. As a delinquent tax collector, I can give you a whole bunch of different scenarios. 
We just had our tax sale. That is a side. No, it's all connected. The budget is designed and it's supported by taxpayers. If your taxpayers can't afford to pay your taxes because you're offering free events, how is that fair? That's We've not We've always offered free events, and it's, that is why many people live in the city. It's they not appreciate that. It is not sustainable. I don't That's mind free events in the city if it's for the city, but a lot of these events are favoring the other communities outside. You Including see, our four parades. Well, what I'm getting at is, I'm going to pick on the early childhood parade. I love the kids. I used to I participated in it when I used to be at school. But the majority of those are coming from outside the area. And, you know, and I, I, I know what the chief goes through because I know what happens if you don't coordinate for a parade. There was a Memorial Day parade where somehow the coordination, the chief, you probably remember that, got messed up and you didn't have enough officers and we were marching down the street and all of a sudden cars were coming right at us. It was because of the lack of a coordination of that event. There was some miscommunication in quote unquote, I guess, an email or something. I don't know what, what the details were, but here we are marching down the street and there's one officer in the cruiser and all of a sudden we're being met by 18 wheelers. So that does take coordination for the parades. We I also, know that. We also had a situation on um, uh, summary where there was no coordination and people were forced to wait over 45 minutes at that intersection. They couldn't get through the city. And that became a safety hazard. And we cannot let that happen. That has no bearing on this policy. It's the reason we have the policy. We it's don't the have the policy. And I hope we don't. Your subject, your subject matter experts are coming forward requesting the council adopt this policy for all these reasons. They include monetary considerations, they include safety and security of the community. It's for I think it's our job to set policy, not staff. Are your staff comprised of subject matter experts are making a request, they're making a recommendation. And I'm, I'm telling you why I am not in favor of it. You're one member of the council. Yes, we, I hope, we hope the council will continue to enter take it to the vote. The one thing I'm not agreeing or disagreeing, but when we pass these policies, for example, for a or not passing, not only is the rec department, you know, kind of the, the one in charge, Newport Police is the only one that has the lawful authority to direct traffic uh, close off roads and everything else. So whatever we decide to do, even though we may be thinking of the recreation and the parades or whatever, we're actually volunteering the, the police department as well because they have to be there. Uh, I know people will wear the best and they'll guide the kids but it's the law officers that have to direct the traffic and close the streets. And that's the only thing that I, I've got to say about that. And again, sympathizing with Newport Police, it is hard to get officers there. You, you need to do it ahead of time uh, to ensure that there will be somebody there for the parade safety. Also, the public works department, neither the police department or the rec department could set up the sign package and do all of that layout. Um, and it's not an easy task getting public works guys in away from their families on Memorial Day. It's, it's a whole community effort. It's a whole, for all the departments. Dan, did you have something? <clears throat> I'm looking at this and I'm looking at the parade policy. To me, the parade policy basically has two lines. You're going to have four parades, and you've got to notify in advance between January. And is that basically the only? I mean, the other stuff applies, but those are the only two lines that really say parade. <clears throat> and and the other thing, I, I'm concerned that um, when we go quarterly, I, I was just counting in my head the events that we had. I believe last year it was probably around 15. I, I don't find that so overwhelming that we still can't be on a two-month basis. That's just my opinion. So, with the when I when I talk about being in the beginning, the middle, and the end of all of these applications, there's quite a, 
a good deal of consultation that goes back and forth. Some of the events now are going on their second and third year, so it's pretty easy, but they still need a reminder of what needs to be submitted when and the deadlines that we need in order to get to the council packets and, oh, you didn't put this on your map, or you need to, don't forget you need to submit the $25. This isn't their bailiwick, so when they come forward to get these permits and things like that, um, there's a little bit of hand-holding there. And when our rec department has, okay, May alone, we had Green Up Day for two days. We have the, we're supporting the uh, Recreation Committee with the Mother Son dances. We have the citywide yard sale at the end of the month, and we have the Memorial Day celebration. So that's four events in May. So having our events that we're trying to corral and take care of, forget the fact that all of our facilities are open this month, to be also helping to go back and forth with a lot of um, education to some degree and reminders for other people. It's quite a bit of work and consolidating that, that into different time frames would be really helpful for us being more efficient in our office. But, but one of these is in the fall. What's that? One of these is actually in the fall, But right? they still want to get the approval ahead of time so that they can advertise and, under, and know that they're going to be doing their event. Okay. Well, I think it's best that we wait for the tracking, tracking, so that you know we can see the the changes, the document track tracking. Really want to see that way you can see the because when, when, when I was everything. Well, no, I was, I would have liked to be honest. I would like the tracking because this weekend I was reading and holding the O and the new kind of trying to figure it out like this and. You know, just to see yeah, the changes. I think it's easier to, or at least a document where the changes are highlighted in red. If that's, you know, there's another way of doing it is you just have everything that's highlighted that shows the changes, additions, deletions. Mr. Mayor, are we still on the parade policy or the. It was both. It was, they, they, it was, well, it was kind of like both. <laughs> and I thought. Because I have a couple questions. Were any events denied? Okay. If an event is denied, is there an appeal process? Good question. Uh, not, not yet. It would be the council that they would appeal to, right? And the council would be the ones making the decision, so I don't... Right. I think that people should know that. And... We're keeping track of the revenue that could possibly be lost. For example, if somebody is using the park for uh, well, for that block party, let's use that for an example. We weigh the fees. Has Newport lost anybody that said, oh, I wanted to rent the park at that same time. Have we lost any revenue? So there are conflicting events all the time. One good example we use is the farmer's market. So the farmer's market is every Saturday throughout the summer, which leaves that facility in that van stand, which is a nice little facility. And you pretty much, in, if they either have to um, cohabitate with the farmer's market, which some events like the Out of Darkness Walk, for example, do, and they do well, but then there are other events like weddings. We get requests for weddings there all the time, and we have to deny them or say you have to be in after the farmer's market or choose Sunday. So that is lost revenue there. As you know, as far as the block party, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm not sure whether there's a conflict there or not, but we do have conflicts all the time. We have to let people know that a space is booked and that is missed revenue if they don't choose another day. Yeah. Do we know how many? No, that's usually just a phone call. So, you know, the space is booked. You want to check for another time, or because it happens very frequently. That's why we reserve the fields because people want to use them all the time. So we book them out specifically in certain spaces. The ball fields is like a madhouse. People, the ball fields are massively overbooked all the time. They're booked from so. But we have had any events in in Garden Park, the fields specifically. Uh, on the baseball fields or on the green space? The baseball fields, I would assume. Um, not in Garden Park, but at the Crowdy Beach, we have a, a ball field that also lives on the upper multi-purpose field, and, and then we also have that space used for overflow camping, so there's a high demand there. And on weekends that we have softball tournaments, we have to turn people away from using the ball field there because that's where overflow camping is. And it's just 
quite a few facilities that also cross each other and you can't they can't cohabitate. Field two is right in the soccer field at Gardner Park. Field one is in the football field at Gardner Park. So. I think in the past year the council has done a good job of not doling out taxpayer money in the form of donations to events. Um, with that said, do, do we need the policy to prevent giving out money? What a policy does is give you structure. Okay, it, gives, it outlines what happens. It gives you. It, it's your backbone of. It helps you make your decision. If you have no policy, then you have nothing to guide you in decisions. So basically, if there's no policy, anybody who comes in. Can, we can we have no reason to ever say no or to say yes it's just like there's no structure to it so what this does is it creates a structure to work in that creates an, a, an equitable playing field for everyone so everyone knows what the rules are no one has to go wink wink or I know this person or um, gee I'm gonna get there before you which is it's a structure yeah. it's a structure to work in so it's equitable for everyone and it's accountability. It's accountability for us to the taxpayers who are footing the bill. And I was a, a supporter of this policy when it passed. Um, but I'm wondering, you know, is it at a point where because of this policy, people may say, I want to do something, hold a concert or whatever. But, Good Lord, it's it's almost impossible to do this, and I've got to go here and there, and other towns would jump at the chance to do it. For example, Isle of Bond has their Friday Night Live. I'm sure that Derby or Coventry would love to to get events if they feel disenfranchised with Newport. I I'm not I don't know having you know one of my past lives having to do events. Um, have, filling out a form is not a big deal, I, I don't believe. Um, and if I can't show budget, if I can't show where my money's going and things, people shouldn't be giving me money. I mean, that means that I'm, I'm, I'm not being honest and transparent and this is where you, I want your money, but I'm not gonna, I'm that disorganized, uh, a budget, what's that? Or, you know, I'm, I'm gonna spend your money really good, don't worry about it because 500 people are gonna come. That means nothing. I, I'm just saying, I'm, I'm <laughs> yeah. there with you on that yeah. and accountability. I like the fact to be able to say, if, if somebody calls up the city manager, what's happening in the park? I see people there and she can say, well, there's this event and, and uh, this is happening and was approved in this council meeting. I understand all that. Mm -hmm. I like policies. Uh, but I, I temper that with we want to attract people, we want revenue and stuff and, and you know, if we're saying, well, normally we rent this gazebo for X amount of dollars uh, on a Tuesday afternoon when they want to have their event, it's probably not a lot of people renting the gazebo. But it's really hard to do for some and not for others. And the other piece is, right. I'll tell you from experience, there's there has been two people that have started this process and not fulfilled it. And it was not because it was too labor intensive. It was um, Phil White who's had experience going through this. And instead of saying, I'm going to go take my event elsewhere, he said, I'll pay the revenue. I'll make the contribution. The other person, which is we just recently got in last week, um, was the schools program. Um, they, I, I started to go through the process. They're brand new to the, to the whole thing. And they said, you know what? We have that in our budget. We'll just pay that. There's been nobody that has come and said, that is crazy. In fact, some of the people that were here at the very first unveiling of this, which was controversial at its time, all still go through the process and say, that wasn't so bad. They're used to the old, remember the six page one that, that happened like three or four years ago that the rec department had that was too much. But we worked really hard to make this um, 
smooth on the user. And like I said, although it looks like a lot here, the user doesn't get this. And I'm like, here you go, make your own way. We go through step by step and, and I say, okay, this is what you need to do. This is the deadline you need to do it. Let me take a look and I'll let you know if there's any changes. It's really a lot more simple than how it might feel to you guys sitting up at that front table. So you provide customer service to the process, yeah. to the people this who are This just applying. guides us in our office. Yeah. To, to know what we need to do next and what's expected because what used to happen is the rec department just, just said sure we'll do that well, sure we'll do that sure we'll do that but the amount of requests that have come through growing exponentially and always growing there's none of these people that have gone very few of these um, third-party events have said we're not going to do that event anymore people like Green Mountain Farmers School who haven't done it for two years and they're back so it's not and, we're not chasing anyone and I agree with you I you know I think the levels of playing field well, what really brought questions to my mind is we had several events tonight coming for the council. They paid the $25 fee and they had a bill where this is how much it, it would cost. And I would buy that we waived those fees. Each one of these, they're doing stuff for free for the kids and for the community and you know then I got thinking do we do this to the farmers market mm. uh, and you know especially the farm to school program I, I, I know that they, they go to Derby Elementary School and they're a good organization and you know it, it's kind of like you're taking money from a charity. It's like, oh, no, you're willing to do that. You, you give me a little bit of money. And granted, it's $25. Don't you feel guilty? Well, it's also this misconception that because we're going through this process that we're anti-event. Sophie did a great job. It was her first time. She's new to this job. It's a great experience. The way that the council should be looking at this is that it's a good experience for these guys to get out and share with their council members, who have very high ranks in the community and know and talk to a lot of people, about the things that are going on in their community. Um, and they didn't have, there was no, they didn't, that wasn't a challenge for them. It's, yes, it is a, a great experience. But also there's that thing, I've got to go there and give it my best because there's $300 riding on this, you know, that we would get billed if the council denies it. I, I guess, I, you know, I'm, I'm just looking, when we have these events that are free, that are benefiting the community, Your events policy doesn't take anything away from that. It does not take anything away from that. What it does is it lets you know exactly what you're approving. You've never denied anything. No, no, You've we never, haven't. So um, your events policy is meant to corral all of the efforts that are required to put on these quality events. When I started here in 2015, there was no process. And the rec department was running amok. There was um, some dissatisfaction from the council at that particular time, and there was a need to get the council's arms wrapped around what was coming, how do we plan for this, how do we execute a better situation. Right. Uh, I remember, and you know, they're giving $1,000 and $2,000 and yeah. but you also, out running like candy. Well, you also had a situation where one hand wasn't talking to the other. So there might be an event going on downstream, and um, I think a good example was the first Rasputitsa. That was before I came here, and the Rasputitsa started on Main Street. Nobody told the businesses. They blocked off Main Street, and it was a disaster. And that's one of the reasons why they've never come back to Newport. Their one hand did not speak to the other. So the police didn't know, the Public Works Department didn't know, the businesses didn't know, only a couple of people within the city of Newport knew. You had about 700 people on Main Street, you had one of those big balloon things. There was total lack of preparation. That is not the standard that we want to recreate here. We want coordination, we want people to know what to expect. We want the businesses to welcome events and you know, not a lot of businesses like events because it interferes with their flow of commerce. So there's multiple things that we have to consider. If we don't have a policy, then you invite running amok again. As Melissa said, 
this provides a structure. And maybe it would, um, maybe one of you guys wants to put on it then and go through this process and see what it's like. Well, I was here when the policy was drafted yeah. and I, I, yeah. I know the things, but is, is it a one size per job? <laughs> And it's, that's what I'm wrestling with. That's what the policies, all your policies, that's the question you have for everything. We've tried to make this um, based on a working document, based on trends, based on what we've learned. We're trying to consider scenarios that we've um, already had experience but didn't have the tools to deal with. Yeah, the communities have policies. No, the communities have policies. Thank you. That's where a lot of this material came from. Was I mean, like, like in Vermont, the communities, the large communities, they must... Yes, yes, they do. Yeah, because we looked at, I remember Seth giving Burlington's, um, it, was, it was a long time ago that I did that research, and I could pull it all back out if you wanted well, No, to. I just was... Yeah, yeah. So it's not like some we created... Some do, some don't. Right, it's not like we just created a policy out of thin air. We're just bringing the structure to the whole thing. Only two more things. Yes. Okay, the first thing, did the um, changes you made to the policy change the application? Uh, the only thing it did was add those quarterly deadlines. Okay, so that's uh, it. We did put in a line that said, we originally read that for, for large events, so just the people that are drawing more than 100, there was a question there that just said sponsors. People took that as... Um, um, not, not what we were asking. So we were asking who else is sponsoring. Are there other towns? Are there other people giving money? And somebody, oh, they thought that it was who does the money go to. So we clarified that wording a little bit and then added the quarterly deadlines. Other than that, the application is not changed. And for me, I would like to see the uh, application uh, an addendum to the uh, policy mm -hmm. so that they're both there for us to, to look at. Now I want to go back to the very beginning, way back day one somewhere around April last year, and you came in and you introduced the uh, events policy. And I had one question. We have the city and we have the applicant. I still have not figured out who that third party is. Right, well, the third party is the people who are not the city. If it's, so if the city it's a city event. So you have, it's a two, city. you have two groups, you have the city, and you have the applicant. So for me, there's only two parties involved in the event. Right, the, 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 so I'm just trying to figure out who the third party the is. The third party, yes, is the applicant. The third party is anyone who's not, who's putting on an event who's not doing it through, through it's not a city <coughs> event. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does make sense to me. Okay. <laughs> so if the city, say the, say the council says, you know what, the heck with everybody else, we're going to put on a parade. The Newport City Council is going to put on a parade. We're going to find ourselves a big Cadillac. We're all going to pile in it, and we're going down the street. Okay? And the city's going to pay for it, and that's a city. That would be city the city event. municipal event, as opposed to somebody coming in who's not employed part of the city. They would be the third party. So it's well, the they, third party is whoever's the outside. They don't want to be a second party. Okay. <laughs> uh, I think we've discussed this enough for tonight. I think it's time to think on it and get the, the, the document where we can see the changes and see all that. Um, I've just sat here kind of taking everything in. But I think the bottom line for me is the structure. It brings structure to the whole process. And that's the way I look at it. It does. It at least lets them coordinate. It brings the structure to the point, well, we know how much resources are public works we're going to need. We're going to, know, we, we, we're going to need to know how much resources from the police department we're going to need. It brings that structure, is what I look at the policy as, as doing. Fees, well, maybe we just, well, I don't want to say that. I won't go there. Yeah, <laughs> as I was going to say, we just waive fees forever and ever, but then that opens up a can of worms. You know, if you say we're going to put on every single event, you could open up a can of worms where you could have people coming in. Because I have heard from businesses who say that some of these events hurt their business mm -hmm. and the numbers don't show. You can track you can track sales by the hour if you want to really get into the weeds of the stuff. Mm -hmm. You can go to the state database and you can go to all this stuff. And a lot of these events do not help the businesses. And the numbers show it. 
But that's something down the road. But as far as the policy goes, to me it just brings structure. The bottom line for me is it brings structure to the whole process. It helps with the planning, helps with everything like that. But with that, I think we need to move on. Um, if we, you could provide that document with the changes yeah. and, and do all that, we'll have this on the next agenda. And I would just encourage any of the council members, if, if what sounds to me is that this is too much for the user, I would encourage you to reach out to any of the people that have gone through this process. You've seen a lot of them in the room. If there's any that you know, ask them what their experience was and let that help guide you if that was your concern. Okay. We'll move on now. The next item is the disorderly conduct civil ordinance update and review. I provided the old DC ordinance and the new one that was reviewed by the city attorney and it aligns statutory language and court decision with the current process. That policy, as I've heard, this had been updated since 1971, correct? Uh, no, there was no, an amendment in 2005. Right, right, mm -hmm. yeah. Will it apply? Or will we get, uh... I'm sorry? Will it work, or will the ACLU? This is con this is consistent with ACLU. Uh, nothing is consistent with ACLU. This is consistent with court decision. Okay. And that's what we care about is court decision. What happens under? That's what we need to be concerned about. So I'm not familiar. Sorry, I'm not really familiar with civil penalties. So if. I am disrupting the peace and I get fined five hundred dollars and I say, so what? What happens to me? It goes to civil collection and the city can choose to either pay an attorney to collect that or not. Okay. Okay. But isn't it a hundred dollars now? Uh, that's what the new policy oh, recommends so because the charter the charter sets the penalty amounts. Mm -hmm. Probably time to relook at the charter and the penalty amounts. There's that rate ordinances in the city that are not up to snuff. Yeah. That rate, I can misbehave a little bit. Pretty much. <laughs> you know, you're going to misbehave? <laughs> I'll make a motion that we approve the uh, disorderly conduct civil ordinance update. A motion to be made. Is there a second? No, second. Second in discussion? Yes. Oh, first council members. Any, anything on this? Um, can, is there any possibility of, other than uh, collections, I know there's civil violations, is there, can be pursued criminally? Not any longer. Hmm. What are some of the standard fines? That our charter is limiting us. I mean, well, the charter, they, the, the they charter they, limits us to what's in the proposed order, which is a hundred, right? But fifty and seventy-five, no more than a hundred, right? But a lot of the state ordinances are things of like five hundred now, right? Uh, While well, you're talking civil traffic violations specifically, yeah, there are there are plenty of violations out there that are in excess of a hundred dollars, absolutely. Okay. Well, no, I was just thinking about charter. It's been a hundred years. And but yeah, my, my thought process is this is quite frankly, I would go out and violate this law for a hundred bucks. <laughs> well, that's what Dan was. That's what yeah, no, that's what I'm getting at. Yeah, it may be time to revisit the city well, charter. I'd look at cop and be like, yeah, give me another one. It's another hundred bucks, and, be like, and then I'm not going to pay it because I'm not going to go through the civil process anyway. Right. That's why we choose to just arrest people for disorderly conduct. But there was some societal influence that requested that we relook at. Um, some of the behavior on Main Street. So that was the purpose of going through this. Okay. Did you have? Yeah, uh, I think a couple of points, if I can remember them all. I find it highly offensive, number one, that um, I could be penalized in any way uh, for how my behavior or what I say um, affects somebody else to violence. The person in that situation that should be in trouble is the person who my free speech has incited, allegedly, to violence. He should get arrested. But I have free speech, 
a constitutional right to free speech, and I should not have to think about if I walk down the street and I'm, um, I'm uh, seeing a group of Ku Klux Klan sympathizers, and I feel like saying, everybody in the United States is equal. We all have equal rights. Um, no, one, no one should be discriminated against. Um, and they, I mean, they decide to get violent because they don't think that those things are true, uh, and they decide to get violent at me, I should not be penalized because I exercised my right to free speech. Maybe some people would say, well, that was a foolish place to do it because you know that the Ku Klux Klan isn't going to be very sympathetic to those views. But thank God in America, I have the right to say um, what's right. And I have a right to say it anywhere um, and I shouldn't worry about whether or not you're going to get violent in response to me for saying the things that are right. Um, and so I think what you've done here in this thing is to overgeneralize a situation in which you worried about one panhandler. And let me tell you, the one panhandler, when he comes up to me occasionally and says that he'd like to have some, would, would I be willing to help him uh, get a meal or whatever, and I feel like saying, no, walks away. <laughs> There's no problem whatsoever. Right. So I do not understand why we are overreacting to, uh, generally to my, uh, to my general free speech, which I think all of us should have, uh, without worrying about who it incites to violence on the other side. And I certainly don't think that with respect to that one person who's asking for money, he does it, you know, without any problem. If you say no, he just walks away. Um, Man, Jack, this doesn't say, this doesn't violate anyone's right to free speech. There's nothing in here that, vi that restricts anyone's free speech whatsoever. Well, but it says if I say it and, and you might uh, have a violent response to it, uh, then I, I shouldn't have said it and I could be penalized for it. No. You would be the one that... I'd be the one getting penalized. Right. It's, for, no it's for like me, if I got violent. You, you, if I got violent, it'd be me the one being penalized, you know, not it you. It says that I'm not supposed to say anything that would incite you to violence. That's not what it says. No, that's the way I read it. Well, I don't think you need, you need it. First of all, the penalties, as you say, are, are de minimis, number one. Number two, you don't need it for that one. You're really talking about that one person. Well, this and is really basically an update of something that we've had in the city charter. It's an update. You should get rid of it. Mr. Mayor. Well, I'll let you go ahead and I'll okay. get my thought to say something. Uh, I actually started looking today for a model policy on the VLCT uh, website, and I didn't find it. And I got distracted and didn't go back for it. Once again, here's something that's being presented to us as an item to possibly vote on, never having seen it before. And if it, it sounds like there's some changes that we might need to make to our city charter in order to make this an effective ordinance. So I would suggest that we, do, that we review the charter first rather than adopt a policy or an ordinance that's going to have to just be changed once we do the rest of the work. I, I disagree. Uh, the charter is a three-year project, minimum three years for city charter. This is something that brings our policy, uh, I, I mean, our ordinance up to date. The, Am I correct, Chief? Yeah. It brings it up to date. It doesn't violate the anyone's free speech. It doesn't violate. Compliant. And when it comes to the gentleman you were referring to, I had him right in my face. Right in my face because I didn't want to give him money. Right, right smack in my face. I kept my cool. I just said, have a nice day and walked on. But that's scaring a lot of people. That truly is scaring a lot of people. We've had business owners where he's discouraged businesses, people from going into their business because the business wouldn't give him money. And so, but this doesn't violate your ability to tell the Ku Klux Klan to go, go to hell or whatever. It doesn't violate your ability one bit. And if the Ku Klux Klan, your example, got vicious towards you, they'd be the ones in trouble, not you. No, but I, I knew that it would create a violence on their part when I said well, what I said. They have to refrain themselves. It's like I refrained myself that day. I mean, you know, it's all a matter of how you refrain yourself. <clears throat> on the back, there is a one.
months, if it gets approved, there is a period where somebody can petition. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. There is, on the back of it, there is a thing where it said uh, people can petition to. Uh, Basically, if, if, if you don't agree with this ordinance, you, you have to get a petition signed by 5% of the qualified voters within 45 days. Uh, 44 days. That's per state statute. So statute does give you the ability, if you so choose, to get the voters to get a petition to disapprove of this. I've done that once before on something else. Very little. Uh, okay. Thank you very much for that. I, I think one of the things we're confusing here is the ordinance and the charter. Right. The charter only recommends the amount of fine. It doesn't detail the ordinance. Correct. So the ordinance is, uh, is uh, detailed based on court cases in the state. So, yeah, so there is a difference. You know, the charter just says it will be 100 bucks. And I'll tell people something. I tried twice in the past to update the charter and it turns into a mess because, well, back then one of the big things was is that the uh, city manager wanted the authority to appoint the clerk treasurer and not have an elected position. So there was fights over, there's probably only five or six places in there that is not superseded by state law now. And, and people fight over those five or six things and Committees don't get anything done when it comes time to do the charter. I worked two years on the charter. I it, came to, it came to the council and it got, got shredded. So, so the number $100, is it effective to do anything? Probably not. You know, but it, it's just as, uh, as $500 effective? Probably not. No. Now, unless you put some teeth into something where you can pull a driver's license or you can pull a license to do something, then people don't care. They're not going to pay that. So. But all we're doing here, this is to bring it more up to date. Up, up to, to date, date in, in alignment with court cases. Uh, right. The, right. Court, yeah. the first one is archaic now. It just is. It's written right by the lawyers. Mr. Wayne, is there a model policy, or did Stitzel Page and Fletcher write this? Chief, did you, Stitzel, Page, and Fletcher amended what was already written by the council in 2005 and 1971? Where their policies come from, I have no idea. And I don't need to know that the LCT has a disorderly conduct, disorderly conduct ordinance draft, so. Thank you. I would suggest that we find some other versions and make sure that we're not going uh, too far astray from I would just suggest that I rescind it then. We'll just arrest people for disorderly conduct because, as Mr. Ross indicated, to go down the road of the charter change to make the ordinance have teeth, that doesn't sound like that's a very easy process. I mean, essentially what this allows us to do is when we have an issue with someone on Main Street, we can go up to them and say, look, you're acting like an idiot, and we'd like you to stop. And if they say, no, I'm not going to stop, then we have the option of giving them a civil ticket and say, look, now you've now been ticketed. Or we can just not have that and we'll just put handcuffs on them and arrest them. But the problem with that is, is that if the, if the state's attorney's office decides that she wants to decline to prosecute, now you've got all these townspeople coming and saying the Newport Police Department's not doing anything about the problem. So it's the council's decision, do you want to have an, intermedi an intermediary uh, decision-making process by the police? Or do you want to let the state's attorney handle the whole thing? Quite frankly and honestly, it's easier for me to let the state's attorney handle it. We'll just arrest everybody for DC, but she chooses to prosecute. We have no say in it. And if townspeople get upset, you can say, I understand that you're upset by that. You should go talk with the state's attorney about it. See, my worry is, is that um, for the police officers, it becomes very confrontational with people that are disorderly. You know, I didn't hear that. I, for me, police officers are in a bad spot when you're dealing with disorderly people. Oh, sure. They're, they're apt to fight back. Absolutely. You know, they're apt to do things where they're apt to have officers hurt. 
the easiest way is to simplify it. A lot of times these people go home. Here's your ticket, go home. You know, try to arrest them and they don't like it. So I don't know, you're damned if you do and damned if you don't. So we can go and look for a better written statement, but I don't think we'll find one. No. And I don't think it occurs that often. No, most times when it rises to the level of disorderly conduct to the point where the police need to intervene, someone ends up getting arrested for simple assault, threatening behavior. Okay. Does the council wish to act on this? Yeah. This evening? I would make motion. I would strongly prefer we wait until the next meeting when we've had time to get public input and review it ourselves and perhaps see some other municipalities' versions of it. I think I made the motion. And it was, sec and it was seconded. Yeah. There was a motion made and seconded? Yes. yes. Okay, there was a motion made and seconded. I we had so much discussion, I forgot. That's right. Okay, any other discussion then? Then all those in favor of the motion to enact the updates, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? No. The ayes have it, motion carries. And as stated before, this was approved tonight, but you have people who have 44 days if they wish to um, appeal. You have to get 5% of the voters, um, and that at that time, if someone presents us with a petition of 5% of the voters, the council then has to act on it, because it's in the ordinance, so we would have to act on the petition. Um, I do the 5% is right. I think it is. Yeah, any ordinance. It's not mentioned in the... Yeah, and yes. any well, ordinance is the, the section is, so we'd have to go look. Um, title 24 PSA. Yeah, Title 24. Right. So we'd have to look to see what the requirements are. Um, what I'm putting in packages is on It's on this page. Yeah. 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 Right here. This is on the back page. That's right from statute. Right there. This is what Jim gave me. Petition signed by 5% of the following voters. That's on any ordinance that we enact. Okay. Move it on. You see that thing? That thing? Okay. Moving on. New business. Do you have anything on behalf of Mr. Johnson? Yes, yeah, sir. So there's an in-house fund uh, request. Seconded discussion. Then all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes have it. Motion carries. Any other new business? I have none. Nothing. Anything new? Mm -hmm. Any new business? Thank goodness, no. <laughs> okay. Anything new? Any new business? Anything? Um, I think our old business. We've got a couple of announcements. Okay. The one new business would be the thing Thursday night. Yeah. Uh, what you, that's uh, the Thursday night is um, an out is a re, uh, outdoor recreation economy. We focus on the Infermega at the Gateway 6 to 8. 
can talk about um, the improved border check-in, Vermont Fish and Wildlife Anger Survey, the Bluffside Waterfront Recreational Trail will, will provide an update. Um, MWA is going to give a brief presentation on preventing the spread of aquatic invasive species. And we'll have a brief presentation on destination development marketing strategies. Six to eight at the gateway. Okay. Upstairs, right? Yeah. Upstairs. Yeah. Indicator. Otherwise, you'll be at Weight Watchers. Yes. Oh, that's right. Weight Watchers is downstairs. <laughs> okay. Old business. Any old business? Uh, a couple things. First, uh, I just want to thank uh, Laura Dogan and Tom Bernier, who's no longer here, keeping us appraised of the sewer breakage on the Glen Road. That was great. I mean, the guys were all over before I even knew what was happening. Sure. Dan was probably. I didn't know other than that there's a big sign just down the street from me. <clears throat> what I feel bad about is that the, in 1990, I don't know, 91 maybe, when they rebuilt the street, I was under the impression that they were going to replace the sewer lines. Mm -hmm. and, no, they never replaced the sewer lines. They put in a force main to the prison, but they didn't replace the existing sewer lines. And they were supposed to install new water services to the houses, but they didn't do that either. There was all part of the prison coming in, correct? Yeah. And then, and then, if years later, when the road had to be rebuilt, it only was a paving job. It wasn't any of the infrastructure. Was that during the years of Tulane? <coughs> no, that's when they expanded the facility, and the agreement was the state was going to come in and fix the road that their heavy trucks did a job on. <laughs> it looks happy. And they're still doing a heavy job on the roads. No, I know. I know, but okay. And, and, and one other thing, Mr. Rand. Um, the last meeting, a request was made for a letter of support to the chamber to rent the green space. What exactly was the request in the letter? I mean, what did they request? Would they request a new board to be partners? Like when they uh, were attempting to lease a green space from the state of Vermont. Uh, they, uh, the request, they thought that they could lease the green space, the chamber. They cannot lease the green space right. for the, the entire summer. They will only lease it to a municipality. But with that said, the only reason why you want to lease the green space would be for the resale of the selling of product or food or, or alcohol or whatever. Anybody can sign up. Um, anyone can sign up to use that space for an event. Um, there's a, I, the, the, the website is extremely easy to fill out the form and to use the space. I understand that, Mr. Mayor. What was their request for the letter of support? They want, they, they, their request was they wanted us to support them leasing the space. But they, because they thought they could lease the space. For the summer. For the summer. Not just for a single event. Right. Not for but, a single event. But, yeah, I, I understand that. That was the that. request. But they, but, they, but they didn't have, but they didn't have the funds. It's $2,000 to lease it for the summer. And then at that council meeting, Mr. James stated, well, the city was going to lease it. And that was shocker to all of us, you know, that we were going to lease it. And it was news to me, and I think it was news to people sitting at the table, um, that, you know, we weren't going to lease the space. I mean, we were willing to work with him if he found the funding. I think we were more than willing to work with him. but. And, and our conversations with the state of Vermont again is they will only lease to a municipality if you want to lease it for the summer in order for an event to sell items or goods. Right. So he, the, the request was to enter into like a joint venture with Newport and leasing this? It's not my, I don't have that impression. 
And I think that Bruce has already reached out to Chris Cole at BGS, and I think that Chris told him he would only lease to a municipality. We don't have... Well, and again, you know, that's a state of Vermont. So I'm just wondering what they required from the city. And, and I'll tell you the reason I ask. Business owners have approached me as if they have approached you in the past. The events that go go on in the green space, they, they do like Newport. They love having the events here. But they indicated they could easily have it in a different town, which would really be... But that's that misinformation. Wednesday, I'm going to use Wednesdays on the waterfront for an example. They used that space two years ago directly from the state of Vermont without having the city lease it. The only difference is last summer they set up a beer tent and a hamburger tent on that space because you can't sell on that space. That's the only difference. They can hold their events there. The chamber held events there in the past. Um, it's just a matter of filling out that online form. So there's a certain undercurrent of misinformation being put out there that if the city doesn't lease the space, nobody can use it, which is totally false. No, no, that's not the, the point. The reason that they had these events, what I'm thinking, is the bands charge money. And the bands said they also had to either rent it or, or build it. So, Yes, they can get this space from the state of Vermont, but they're, they really have no way of generating revenue. To, to not for profit, but to help offset the cost of what they're putting on for the benefit of the city. Mm -hmm. Well, that one event got large sponsorships from JP, the hospital, you know, there's a lot of sponsorships that went into that event. Um, I come at it that, you can still hold events there. There's nothing that's preventing the holding of events. And I wouldn't have a problem if, say, we, if we didn't budget that $2,000, you know, right. to pay for it. Um, and if you want us or anyone wants us to pay the 2000 to lease it, we're going to have to find 2000 in the budget to cut. And you know we could take if you if you so choose we could take it out of that eleven thousand that we allocated for waived event fees and then you're going to reach a plateau that's and right. you're going to reach a plateau but that's not good till July first and and, and, and that's, that's the see the, no no that the, 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 the original question was what did they ask for support from the city of Newport and uh, yeah they they, they realized they can <coughs> petition or apply for the space from directly from this the state and get it for free. But when they had it last year they were able to have like a fifty fifty raffle. Oh they can still they have a fifty 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 on there. They just I don't know, I thought they couldn't sell no. tickets or anything. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like Vero and Andrea they came before the board in February. They never mentioned that they were requesting the green space to be leased by the city. They haven't made any an overture to me or to Jess about their needs. This has been in the media a lot lately. Right. So uh, it and, sounds and like maybe there's a phone call from Jess, I mean from Andrea or Vero to Jess that needs to happen. No. Again, we were really going off base. There was no request for the city to rent the space. There was no uh, right. misunderstanding of, of, you know, applying directly from the state of Vermont versus leasing it. And my assumption is that when you are able to have a 50-50 raffle or have a vendor there or uh, a beer tent, whatever, that that money could be used to offset the bands which come and give music. This is proof that free events are not sustainable. This is the problem that we're having. They're running into that on the third year. They've got these expenses. They have these opportunities. 
but free events are not something that can be sustained year Any after year. Any requested from the city of Newport a letter? Bruce wanted a letter saying that we support him in his endeavor of leasing the space. And I explained to him that the state will not lease it to the Vermont's North Country Chamber. They will only lease it to the city. But then that night, we also said, if you can find the $2,000, I think, I think we said that yeah, that night, yeah, yeah. if you can find the $2,000, then we'll work with you and we would lease the space. Because yeah. it's kind of like the downtown group. They paid last year the $2,000. We, but we leased the space because they only lease to municipalities. They do not lease to anyone else. Chris Cole even verified that this past week. Mm -hmm. I verified it. We verified it again with, with Mr. Cole. The other, um, the other dilemma that we have if we decide to go down that road is we have no programming. We have nobody that's come forward and said we want to we want to utilize that green space. So why spend the funds when you have no stimulus? So that's the other sticking point, particularly if somebody comes forward with short-term planning. I mean, here we are mid-May, and, and, and short-term planning, they can go to directly to BGS and fill out the permit. There's been no request for right. funding from, from the city. Right. I, I want to be very clear on that. And I understand, I mean, you guys have been in contact with the state, and I'm sure they probably have preferences on, on who they lease their space to. My question is, in this letter of support, if we say, hey, Chamber of Commerce, that's great. If you want to raise the money and do whatever, we have no interest in leasing this space this year as a city of Newport. If, you know, God be with you, go to the state of Vermont, they may or may not lease it to you, but... But we do have an interest if they were, if they came up with the funding. And a plan. And a plan. And what would our interest be? Well, no, we were willing to work with, we said it that night, if you could find the $2,000 and had a plan and what you want to do, we would be willing to work with them. Work with Bruce and the Chamber. But he's actually been asked for another plan and still hasn't provided it to another meeting I was in, he was point blank asked for the plan because he wanted funding for something and they asked for his budget. He still hasn't provided the budget. They were willing to provide him funds, but he still hasn't provided the budget. Um, this was something else. But what I'm getting at is, I heard a lot in the last week, why is the city undermining the chamber? Why are we doing this? Why are we doing that? But we're not. Right. You no, know, and, 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 and that's the thing. thing. No, the thing is, he was asking for the letter of support to lease the space because he was under the impression he could lease that space when he can. And that's why we said, you know, but then that night, then I'm going to repeat it again. We said if you can find the $2,000 to lease this, to, 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 to pay for the lease, because that's what it costs for the summer. Can provide programming. Doesn't, well, uh, to me, the programming is not a, a moot point in such a way because if he's paid the space to lease, right, if he's paid the 2000 to lease it and then doesn't have any programming, well, that's his fault. It's not our fault. You know, that's why I look at that aspect. You know, if he pays the money to lease it, it's up to him to provide the programming and all that stuff. And again, it, it's not rules. I, there's been business owners that have... So the letter of support that was asking the council to you know write a letter of support for Bruce to rent the, the property chamber, yeah. for the, oh, the chamber property. sorry I said um, Bruce, but yeah. yeah the chamber to rent it I think that the council you know why would we write a letter of support for something that can't happen It's not our decision So except I mean it, know it, it would it be up to me Yeah uh, I was a scout leader. Mm -hmm. Little kids would have dreams of being whatever. Mm -hmm. I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. The back of my mind, there ain't no way in hell are you going to do that. Am I going to tell them that? Or am I going to try to say, okay, that's a, that's a good goal. What, what, can we do, what can I do to help you? I can't guarantee, I can't. You have do to change anything. state statute. That's the that's what you have to do is change state law right. to allow um, which, that, I, which to allow BGS buildings. And again, that's 
all I, my initial question was, in that letter, what did he ask? Would that have cost us or put us on a line? We couldn't have done it because he was asking for us to support the chamber at least in the space when he could not do it. But he can. No, he no, can no, 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 no. For he, specific he, days, he can. Right, but he was asking for the summer. He was, he was asking, asking us for the summer. He, he wanted us to see, lease to, to write a letter because the chamber was under the impression they could lease the space for the entire summer, which they cannot do. That's what he wanted the letter of support for. Um, as far as individual events, we could write a letter if he wants to hold Aquafest down there. We could write an individual letter for one event, but if it's leasing it for the entire summer, it's a moot point because he, and he shouldn't even need a letter of support mm -hmm. under those circumstances. Right, he won't need it for one event because you just go online. I think I sent you the links you asked me, and that you just go online and fill out this online form. Right, and again, that's that's not leasing it. That's just getting permission to use it. And right. Again, he, you're back at the thing where to generate money or revenue to sustain it or to help pay for the the bands or whatever. The bottom line is, we were willing to work with him. If he came up with the funding for the $2,000 that it would cost for the season, we were going to work with him because it would have to come to the city and be on the city's insurance, and there would have to be all that. But we left it up to him if he would have to find the funding to pay for it for the summer. The reason that um, BGS will not lease to somebody who's not a municipality has to do with our services that are available that include police and public works. Right. If somebody um, leases, if somebody rents the space from the city and leaves the space in a deteriorated state, then we're on the hook. Okay? So um, Wednesdays on the Waterfront left it immaculate. Last year we didn't have any problems. So um, by having an entity go straight to the BGS permit, we're not involved. They still get the same bang for the buck, it's free. I'm assuming. It just can't set. And, and again, uh, that gentleman said he spoke with whomever in the state of Vermont. If he was told there's no way in, in the good earth we're going to rent this to you, then why would he come to the council? And he must have been told by the state that Okay, we need to we need to know that the city isn't going to lease the space, that you're not in competition with them, that you know they're you're not doing something that's counter to the the city's intentions. Hmm. Um, I don't know if that had anything to do with it. When I spoke to Chris, um, he wondered, and Chris is Chris Cole, commissioner of BGS. Um, he wondered if we were interested in leasing it, and I said we've had no requests, we've had no inquiries at all, and neither has the downtown organization. But to, in order to change it, we'd have to get state statute, state statute changed in order to allow individual or like the chamber, or even the, because they wouldn't even, that was the first question we asked with the downtown group a year ago. Can you lease it directly to the downtown group? Because they were interested, right? The downtown paid the fee. They paid the fee, but they were interested. But that's yeah. when we found out that they would not lease to an entity, only a municipality. Is it a statute or a policy? It's a policy. Is it a policy or statute? It's, I believe it's a policy. And as Chris Cole explained it to me, if I can do it justice, he said, if we're leasing to an entity that's not a municipality, we have no business owning it. We would have to sell it. It's BGS property. So and that comes in, and that statute, I think that part. I don't know. I There's some know weird things statute. there. Right. Jess had her hand up earlier. Oh, I missed it. Sorry. <laughs> you missed it. Okay. I'm sorry. Up and down. I didn't uh, see it. I'm sorry. So Thank I you. I think the man. initial request was for for us to write a letter of support. And I think that Bruce was indeed hoping that our letter of support could sway BGS. Um, and I don't know if he, if he realized to what degree, whether it was policy or whatever, that he couldn't. Um, 
the thing, I know that you were talking about the Boy Scouts. Um, I, we, through our office, we get a lot of seasonal employees and they go on to get big people jobs and they often call for a letter of recommendation or a reference letter. Um, when the state leases to the city, they have an understanding that we have a certain level of capacity. So if somebody goes in there and blows donuts for one of these events, we have a public works department that can go and fill that in and be like, nothing happened. The Chamber of Commerce does not have that. Um, if that were to happen, Bruce, Bruce, I think, is the only maybe paid staff there. The rest is all volunteer level. They don't have equipment. They don't have things like that. So for the city to, to write a letter of support, I think there would be a level of sticking our neck out because I know from experience working with Bruce on events and things like that, he's really good with ideas, but doesn't have a lot of um, support in the way of on the foot work. So for the city to say, yes, we think the chamber would be great for this, and, and uh, that they're okay for all of the reasons that we know you're concerned about, the insurance liability, the property management, and things like that, I think would be the city taking on, um, would be putting our neck out there a little bit, and we're not necessarily been proven in pre that that is necessarily would be true. So, although it would be nice to say, yes, we won't go get them, Tiger, there's a certain degree of we have to be really realistic right. using what we know. And I think that that may be the perception right there. We may know, or, or we may have the information that it probably isn't going to be released. However, when we say, as a council or, or a person, you're probably not going to get us get this lease, so we're not going to give this letter to you because, yeah, we're we're not even going to bother wasting our two minutes it would take to draft the letter. So if we put the letter out there and then something did happen, the city has the, so and so the state said yes, we'll lease it to the chamber based on the fact that the city trusts them to take care of this space in the same way that they would take care of it themselves. And then something happens and that doesn't happen, or there's a lawsuit or something like that. The city, our, our name is just... Right. Mr. Mayor, there's so much presumption going on. I think Mr. Charbonneau's point is, we could in good faith write a letter saying, we support the chamber leasing the green space from the state. End of story. Not that we're willing to take on the liability if something goes wrong, it's not our job to influence state policy or anything up there. That's not our level. Our level is, do we support it or not? Yes or no? But the bottom line is, we cannot write a letter because we know that they will not lease to the chamber. That's so not why, our business. So why write a letter? I'm not going to write a letter or encourage the council to write a letter if we know that they will not lease to the chamber. That is state policy. And I've known that for two years, three years. Because there was, a, there was misinformation out there a few years ago where no, people thought they couldn't even use the green space. And that was something that we alleviated by going to Montpelier and meeting with Commissioner Obahowski at the time. He says, no, you just fill out this form and you can, you can use the green space. You can't sell things on it because that's state policy. But for us to write a letter knowing that it cannot happen, I mean... I, the way I look at it, Mr. Mayor, is... They're not asking us to violate the law. They're not asking us to underwrite their, their funding. And, and that was my original question. What did they ask? And if they said, we, we want a letter of support, and, and some of the business owners were like, we had heard the city might be leasing it, and that's why we need this letter as clarification. So I'm wondering about these business businesses. Are you comfortable referring them to Jess and or me? What would that accomplish? Um, we could give them the story. <laughs> we could tell them exactly what the circumstances are, and maybe they have a plan. Maybe there's more out there than we realize. Maybe the businesses are interested in coming forward and funding the lease. Is that something that's possible? Are they are the businesses interested in? an entre entrepreneurial opportunity to the point where they would kick in some of the funds? Well, I, I don't know. I, I, and that would be my great. understanding is that, you know, they're not requesting the money from the city. That if they're not requesting the money, they must have their own source. But to give the, the money to the city to lease the space, then the city now is 
with the events policy, trying to say, well, now you have to go through this. You, you've given us the money, but now we have the, this policy you have to go through. What's wrong with that? Why should they if they can, if, if they if can they, get the letter? But you still have your third party event considerations that you have to worry about. You still have to worry about your safety and security and your cleanup. Because remember, even though we hold the lease, we're still responsible for the conditions. So I don't think that's being unreasonable. If, if we had the lease, yeah. if, they, if the state leased it directly to the businesses, we would be out of it. There is no event policy because it's no drain on city resources. It's in a contract between them and BGS. So the part about BGS only leasing to a municipality is where? Where's the credibility that that statement has for you? Is that, is that a credible comment? So what if? We don't know that. We yeah, have not talked to this. Could you get an email? Could you get it in writing from yeah. Chris Cole? Yeah. Because that was clearly stated two years ago. If you could get him, to, he was supposed to have sent an email because Representative Marcotte informed uh, us how he was interrupted in his committee several times by the commissioner over this whole thing. And the commissioners and Mike asked the commissioner to send us and the people requesting it an email, and he never sent that email. So if you could get Commissioner Cole to send the email with a copy of the state policy, it'll put it to bed. That's, I mean, we've been here long enough. It'll put it to bed, you know, in my opinion. I mean. It troubles me the council doesn't believe it. It's like they, they think I'm a liar. I hate no, to say that. I really no, do. No. I think, I think you're, you're questioning whether I'm telling the truth. I, I, I went to Montpelier with the former city manager to get to get it in writing that people could use the green space because that was the misinformation amongst the businesses, amongst the chamber at the time, amongst everybody that that space was off limit and nobody could use it for anything. And we got that, we got that hurdle crossed. Um, and, now, and now we've got this and I, to be very blunt, I wish Mr. James was here. I was blindsided that night when he said, well, the city's leasing the space. We never discussed that with the chamber. You know, he, and he came here and he blindsided us saying, and that got out there, oh, the city was going to lease the space. And we weren't going to lease the space. And we made that offer that night. If you found the funding, we would work with you. And he has yet to come back. He, it's been, what, a month now, two weeks? Whatever. Three weeks. Three weeks now. He could have easily gone and found the funding and said, okay, I want to be on the agenda tonight. I've got the funding. Will you consider leasing the space? I haven't heard a word. Not a word. And so, and, and nobody's questioning anybody's integrity, nobody's saying anybody's a liar or, or whatever. And I know that you have done quite a lot for the city. Uh, as a matter of fact, you know, when people say, what does the mayor do? I say, a lot. Um, more, more, it should be a full-time job, but the, the question, my initial question, and I think we've gotten sidetracked, uh, was what did they request from us and would it have cost us anything to do it? And the fact that we did it is perceived as, as being anti-business. You know, we may know the end result, but it's the lack of additional support. So as an ambassador of the council and the fact that you were here, um, maybe there's some corrective action that could be taken since you were part of the group that was blindsided. You know, to just leave it there and say the council's bad, the council's anti business because we were blindsided by somebody who said, oh, you're going to do this. We met with Bruce in advance, promised us he wouldn't blindside us. He understood at that particular meeting that we would lease the space if we had a funder and we had programming. We had no stimulus. So it's very convenient how this has turned into the city council being the bad guy when you guys do a lot. It's, it's, that's an unfair characterization, particularly if you look at what you gave away tonight, and what you supported tonight. So there's, there's a misnomer out there when you think about all the programming and the services that the city already offers, that there's a belief that we need to do more and do it free 
it's not sustainable. It's not fair. The services that we do provide are competent and capable and cost effective. You keep giving stuff away, it's not going to be cost effective. It's not going to be sustainable. Right. Absolutely. And I agree 1,000%. And nothing we're is not, free. We're, we're not your ATM to give out money. Again, I was just. Aren't you glad you asked? <laughs> well, why, why couldn't we write the letter? And, and, and I think it goes back to what yeah. Jess pointed out. You're putting your neck out in a way that. Um, okay, I think. Yeah. Okay. I'm looking at the around. hour. Um, any other old business? Anything? Nothing. The only old business I had was, I'm sure everybody knows, but we were awarded the 85000 for the intersection from the downtown transportation, which is good news to redo this intersection, and that includes flights for the crosswalks in that intersection. It does. Red it does. Flashing beacons. The fashion for the crosswalk. It includes uh, better um, curbing. Okay. Um, it includes uh, safety features out here that we don't have a wider field ad for the um, um, loading trucks. Okay. Anything? And you want to mention the AARP? Oh, we applied for 3000 from the Vermont chapter of AARP, and they said no for that one. Um, they thought our project was great, but they had so many requests mm -hmm. come in, so on that one. But that's all I have. Any old business? Anything? Just quick. Um, last year, we uh, appointed another person to sign warrants. We appointed uh, Dennis. You're and right, we need somebody in case I can't do it. I thought it would be Julie if she would volunteer. <laughs> if you work just up the street, right? Yeah, so, as, but Melissa does as well. Just one other person, just in case I can't make it, because there was one time I did call Dennis to come in because I was out of town. So we should appoint somebody else, I mean, whoever can do it. Do it make sense of being president? Yeah. Sure. Okay, Thank I move that we appoint uh, the mayor and or Truly to approve and sign warrants for the disbursement of operating expenses. And motion to made. Is there a second? No second. Seconded. Discussion? Then all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes have it. Motion carries. I'm glad you picked up. Good, good, good catch on that one. I forgot okay. about that. Anything on, don't something on somebody else, I'm happy. Oh. <laughs> Anything else? Old business? Any old business? All right, the next meeting will be Monday, May 20th at 6.30 p.m. We need a motion to adjourn at 8.52. I'll make that motion. Motion made. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? 